Today, we're going to be taking a look at Psalm 91. And so while we're working on trying to get some technical difficulties sorted out, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start reading that. And one of the things that I did was uh, I asked folks, if you have your Bible or your version app or whatever the case may be, um, then go ahead and uh, open that up to Psalm 91. And that's where we're going to be today. And I'm just going to read this. This is from the NIV. And uh, then hopefully we'll get the technical difficulties sorted out in the meantime. And then after that, we can kind of go through some of the big points. And so Psalm 91 is where we're going to be today. Uh, and it begins like this. Here's what the psalmist says. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snail, s- snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishments of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and on the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me, says the Lord. I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. Do we have the technical difficulties sorted out? Who knows? Who knows? But it's a great psalm, isn't it? That sounds, hey, I think think we're good to go now. Yeah, it's a great psalm and it's and it's one of those special psalms that has been used in the past. So one of the reasons that we're talking about at Concordia praying Psalm 91 is because way back when the Ebola outbreak happened in, in uh, West Africa, one of the one of the mission agencies, Young Life, asked all of their people and anyone around the world who wanted to to pray with them Psalm 91, this wonderful psalm that talks about deliverance and rescue and talks about God's protection and his care. And so they began to pray Psalm 91. And as they began to pray Psalm 91, it was amazing because the Ebola outbreak began to to be squashed. It began to disappear. And God's hand was clearly in that. And so as we're facing this crazy pandemic and all kinds of things that are happening, all kinds of scary circumstances in our country, in our community, around the world, it seemed only reasonable. We ought to be praying Psalm 91 in the very same way with the very same confidence and faith. And so that's, that's how we began to be involved in this. I know Young Life has also renewed their efforts to have folks pray Psalm 91. But Zach, this morning when you and I were talking about this psalm, you had some amazing insights as to what was going on. And so, again, shocking surprise to everybody. Hey, we've got three points today. But, but and, hang on and write these down because these three points and, and the insights that go along with, along with them are very powerful and, and really going to make a difference in your understanding of this psalm and in your confidence during this frightening time. And so the first point, and this is so critical, especially at a time like this, and this is just generally needed. We all want protection. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that uh, we could survey pretty much anybody watching Uh, anybody listening, anybody uh, watching even a few days from now or weeks from now, and uh, they would want the same thing. They would want protection. And one of the things that this psalm just expresses beautifully is the way that God protects people. If you go back to verses one and two, how how does it, how does it express it? It expresses it beautifully. Beautifully? Beautifully. Okay. Uh, You know what? The, the, The word is so exciting. Right, and the psalm is so beautiful. I add a little extra syllable just to drive the point home. I I can't resist taunting you just a little bit. That's fine. (laughs) So, back to verses one and two. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, 
And then the psalmist says, I'll say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now notice in verse one, how God is talked about. He's talked about as the most high and the almighty. And that's, that's good stuff. Because that means that God has a lot of power. The most high is not just kind of high, not just really high. There's no one higher than God. He is the Lord over everything, the king over heaven and earth. And not only that, he's almighty. And so he not only has supremacy, he has all power. There's no power that he doesn't have. And you kind of want someone with that kind of strength protecting you. But it goes deeper than that. Because in the very next verse, when the psalmist actually addresses God, he calls him the Lord. Now, now you may notice that that word Lord is in all caps, and that's because the old Hebrew word behind that word is Yahweh, which is the personal name of God. And so it's not just that God has all power, it's that he's very personal. And when you put those two things together, what you get is this, this amazing sense of protection, because that's really what we want when we want protection. We not only want someone who has a lot of power and strength, we, we want someone who's personal, someone who, who we can trust. Because someone who has a lot of power, but we don't know, <laughs> they're, not so, they're not so appealing to us. They're more scary to us because we don't really know what they're going to do to us. Well, Zach, it's kind, God, of like yeah. a, kind of like the situation when, we, when you have some kind of a problem. You buy something and it doesn't work or you have a problem with a, an arrangement that you've made and you call and you talk to someone and you don't get anywhere. You don't feel like anything happens. And so you ask to talk to a manager because you feel like they're going to have more interest in what you're concerned about and you don't get anywhere. And you finally say, you want to talk to the owner. You want to talk to the yeah. president. You want to talk to somebody who has a vested interest. We want people who not only have power, we want people who are interested in our concern. And the beauty of what you're describing to us is that we have a God who's not, all, not only all powerful, but we have a God who is personally intimately and passionately connected to each and every one of us, cares about every, everything that we face. Now, the psalm becomes even more beautiful, okay, uh, yeah. when you realize that the kind of protection that this very personal God, the Lord, Yahweh, offers. You go to the next couple of verses, right? Verse 3, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. Here's the idea. A fowler, someone who's trying to catch you, someone who's trying to trap you, uh, someone who's an enemy to you. Uh, the Lord cares about you so much personally that those who are out to get you, he, he's there with you. But then in the very next verse, he will rescue you from the deadly pestilence. Now, um, mm. I don't know if there's any phrase that's more relevant to what we're experiencing and facing as we are doing this isolation Bible study than that phrase right there. Um, in the ancient world, it was common too. There would be these pandemics that would sweep through uh, the world. And they would take thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of people's lives. And the psalmist says, in that kind of a world, which is really in our kind of a world, we have a personal God who, who's there with us. Not only that, verse 4, look at what it says. He will cover you with his feathers. Uh, you may remember th this song. Uh, back in the late 90s, there was a song that was real popular called, And He Will Raise You Up on Eagle's Wings. And it was based on Psalm 91. And that's one of the lines where, where, this, where this song comes from. Our God's protection is not just powerful. It's also incredibly gentle. Our God's protection is kind of like the protection that a down comforter offers you, right? When you're snuggling in for the night. And then finally. You know, when, I, when I hear that, Zach, I, I think about, and I wish I knew how to do it. One day we'll, we'll be technologically savvy enough with this equipment to make it work. But one of the things that I, I loved was a picture that Natalie sent to our to our staff team recently. It was a picture of a of a mother bird, and she had her wings spread like this, and underneath each wing was one of her little babes. And it was a beautiful, beautiful depiction of exactly what is God is saying to us here in Psalm ninety one. And so, notice then when He protects us, verse five. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. And so we got night and day. We got darkness and midday. How much time does that cover? All the time. There's not a time that the Lord personally and powerfully isn't protecting us. And then the very next verse, it says, a thousand may fall at your side. 
10,000 at, at your right hand. Now, whenever you see big numbers like this, uh, here's what you're not supposed to think, okay? You're not supposed to like start an enemies list of 10,000 people and try to fill it up and fill it out and go, okay, I wonder who God can get rid of for me. Uh, th those are round numbers that simply express wholeness. There's that real famous verse, right? Uh, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. But what does that mean? It means all time is God's time. And, and so here's the idea. Anyone who wants to hurt you, who wants to destroy you, who wants to come after you, anything that would do you damage, God's there with you through all of it, anytime, in any circumstance. Awesome. So anyone and everywhere, no matter who's falling, no matter how many people are going down, we have a God who is with us. That's point number one. We all want, we all need protection. Point number two. Yep. We've all uh, had trouble. Yeah. All and this, right? is where, this is where things get a little bit more realistic, right? You, you read the first part of that psalm and you go, oh man, isn't that nice, right? Here's a God who raises us up on eagle's wings. He has feathers and uh, day and night he's with us with thousands and ten thousands. He, he protects us. Uh, but then you get down to verse uh, 14, okay? And, and there's this man. And by the way, we'll get back to this man a little bit later in this psalm, okay? But there's this man who loves the Lord. And the Lord says of this man, verse 14, because he loves me, I will rescue him. I will protect him, the same thing we all want, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, this man will, God says, and I will answer him. And then notice the very next line, because this is where the psalm gets very realistic. I will be with him in trouble. Now, notice what the psalmist doesn't say. Uh, he doesn't say, okay, God's just going to take away all of our trouble, or God's going to make sure that we never go through trouble. He says God is going to be with this man. God's going to be with us in trouble. Now, if we're in trouble, what does that mean we have? It means that we have trouble. It's just part of life. And this is so important because sometimes, right, every single, every single once in a while, you'll, you'll hear people uh, speak in terms of God's protection as just making everything great, as never having any trials, any worries, any concerns. That just isn't true. In, in fact, just a little picturesque Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word here for, for trouble is the word sarah. You can actually spell it like, like the name Sarah. And uh, it means a tight spot. A narrow place. Now, I think it's pretty easy to relate, right? To being in a tight spot. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all in tight spots over and over again. I think. I mean, think about the the situation that we're in as a as a world, right? This is a tight spot. The the situation we're in with our economy, it's a tight spot. I mean, that's something we can relate to. And I love the way you're bringing that out here in the Hebrew. Beautiful. And so uh, if you go back through the stories of the scriptures, right, you realize that this is something that happens over and over again. When Adam and Eve first fall into sin in the garden, it's not that, right? The trouble just disappears. It's that God sticks with them, even in the tight spot. Uh, when the wickedness of human beings becomes so terrible that a giant flood overtakes the whole earth, it's not just that, you know, the giant flood disappears. It's that God is with Noah in a tight spot. Uh, when the Israelites are backed up against the sea and Pharaoh's army is coming toward them, and they are quite literally in a very tight spot. There's not a lot of room between Pharaoh's army and this big body of water. God is with them in the tight spot. Even the disciples, when they are getting close to the cross and when they are completely freaked out because they're not only worried about what's going to happen to Jesus, if we're really honest with ourselves, they're a little bit more worried about what's going to happen to them. Uh, God is with them in a tight spot. And so one of the questions we can just ask ourselves very practically and very relevantly about the psalm is this, um, where is my tight spot? And then the follow-up question that can be kind of hard is not just, okay, God, get me out of this tight spot, but, but God, what are you trying to teach me in this tight spot. So when we think about this, Zach, the, the first point is sort of a general 
idea, right? We all want to be safe. We all have problems. We all have troubles. Second point is that specifically that, that we all have trouble. Now, this third point, as we think about the reality, we, we're all in a tight spot. We all want protection. We love what Psalm 91 lays out for us. Point number three kind of puts its finger right on the key issue. We all need a savior. Yeah. We all need to be delivered. So if you read through the Old Testament, here, here's what you'll find. You'll find that Jesus is all over the Old Testament. In fact, there's actually a genre of psalms known as messianic psalms. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that if you look for Jesus in the psalms, you're going to find Jesus in the psalms. And by the way, this isn't just us kind of making this up and going, okay, let's see if I can find Jesus in a psalm. This is something that Jesus himself encourages us to do. I was exactly. talking to the... Just for one second. Let's, let's yeah. be sure. So, so when you hear the word messianic, think yeah. Messiah. Jesus, yeah. the Messiah. And so when you hear Messianic, it's saying it's talking about the Messiah who is Jesus, just so everybody's clear and with you. Please go ahead. And, and so Jesus encourages us to do this. Uh, there's this one time where the religious leaders are, are giving him trouble, which is pretty much all the time, right? And uh, Jesus has to say to him, hey, you guys search all these scriptures, and that would have been the Old Testament right? All, all the Psalms, all the prophets, all the writings of Moses, uh, because you think that by them, you can find life. And then he says, these are the scriptures that testify to me. And so here's the invitation for, from Jesus. Look for me in these kinds of scriptures, because I'm all over the place. And, and here's where Jesus is in Psalm 91. He's actually in the very first word of Psalm 91. Verse one. This is where this is where it kind of it kind of throws us for a loop, right? Because it's easy to misunderstand, and, and partly it's translators' faults, right? Mm -hmm. but well, it's, and, it's to understand what Psalm ninety one is actually speaking about, or who it's speaking to. And so, the very first word of Psalm ninety one. Now, if you're using the New International Version, they translate this as as whoever. It's probably not the best translation of this. Um, it, it's actually he, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, he will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, now here's the idea. There's, there's a he, there's a person, there's a man who always dwells in the shelter of the Most High, who always rests in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, let's just do a little gut check here and get real honest about us and ourselves. Sometimes we wish that was us, <laughs> but we don't always behave like it's us. Here, here's kind of the protection that we sometimes want from God. Here's kind of the refuge that we want from God. We want refuge in God when God is kind of a little add-on refuge, right? But before we get refuge in God, what do we take refuge in? Oh, our education or our money or our comforts or our uh, friends or our house. And, and then after all of that, we find a little bit of refuge in God. But if one of those things gets taken away, <laughs> we get totally shaken up because first our refuge, sometimes if we're just honest with ourselves, we put our refuge in those things first. We find our comfort and protection and peace in those things first. The psalmist says, there's gonna be a man who always and only finds his refuge in the most high who always and only finds his protection in the shadow of the Most High. Now, it's not you, it's not me. And so the question is, who is it? Now, can I say something shocking? I, I think you're going to anyway. Well, I'm going, yeah, so, so we actually learn who this Psalm is about. And the most, interesting character gives us the answer to whom this psalm is about. If you go down to Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12, uh, there are these two verses that, that may be vaguely familiar to you. They say, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now, yeah, now wonderful. you've heard those words before. Yeah, we know that verse, right? That's a wonderful yeah. promise that we, we claim as God's protection in every circumstance. So who speaks the words? The devil to Jesus in the wilderness. 
Now, here's the key. Amazing. He speaks them in the wrong way, right? He, he misappropriates the verse. He pulls it out of context. We'll see that. In fact, it's really interesting, the verse that he doesn't quote that comes right after these two verses. Uh, but, but he misappropriates the verse. He pulls it out of context. But, but here's what he does. He quotes it to the right guy. Because yeah, he even knows, he knows Satan, who it's spoken to. He knows who this psalm is about. This psalm is about Jesus. Now, here's the verse that Satan leaves out. The very next verse, verse 13. This, this man who's going to be protected and loved and cared for by God, he will tread on the lion and on the cobra. You will trample on the great lion and the serpent. Now, what is Satan called? In First Peter chapter 5, he's called a roaring lion. What is Satan called in Revelation 12 verse 9? He's called an ancient serpent. Uh, something tells me that being treaded upon and destroyed, that's not the verse that Satan really likes or wants to quote to Jesus. But Satan knows who this psalm is about. So I love, I love the point then. So that, the, that first word is not whoever dwells in the shelter, but he, and it's specifically written to Jesus. That yes. this, this psalm is to Jesus. It talks about Jesus. It tells us about Jesus. It tells about God's relationship, the Father with his Son. But in some ways, it kind of takes the wind out of our sails if we don't understand just a little bit further, right? Because if this is all about Jesus... Maybe we really shouldn't be praying this for hope and deliverance and protection and, and mercy, right? Maybe we've well, got the wrong idea. And there's the key. The psalm's about Jesus, but because it's about Jesus, it's also for us. Yeah, love Here, here's the idea. How, how do we get protection? Well, we don't just get protection that kind of falls from the sky. <laughs> we get protection through Jesus. He protects us from our sin. He protects us from death. He protects us from the devil. How, how do we get rescue? Well, God actually rescues us in a very simple way. He doesn't just go, zap, I'm going to rescue you. He rescues us through Jesus, from sin and from death and from the devil. That's why if you miss Jesus in the psalm, you actually miss the most important part of the psalm. Uh, because here's how personal this psalm is. You want to talk about how personal God is, right? How the psalmist can call him the Lord, use the personal name of God, Yahweh. He, here's how personal God is. He personally comes to us in like a human being, in flesh and blood, in, in someone who not only talks to us about troubles, but who knows our trouble. In other words, this psalm isn't just some nice words about, oh, we all go through hard times. This psalm is about someone who actually went through those hard times. He knows about trouble. He knows about pain. He knows about being attacked. He knows about snares and pestilences and enemies. He, he dealt with it all and he did it for us. So, Zach, we're going to come back to this psalm next Wednesday and dig into a little bit more, and maybe uh, for a couple of weeks. We're almost at the end of our time. Our, our Lenten midweek service, Pastor Ben's preaching, is going to be awesome. It's coming up right after we're done here. But I just want to invite you, if, if you're going through this, this isolation, if you're going through this time of pandemic and financial stress and fears and all of the things that go along with it, you are not alone. This psalm was written to Jesus for us. And when you're struggling, when you're hurting, when you're afraid, when you maybe feel panic welling up, you, all you have to do is speak to him. All you have to do is, is, is call out to him and tell him what's on your heart and ask him for the help and the strength and the peace and the comfort that you need because he's always there. He never leaves us and he never forsakes us. Dear friends, let's take just a minute now and pray as we wrap up and, and head into our worship service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible blessing of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have, you have prepared that word for us with such meticulous care. And it, it describes over and over and over again a powerful Savior who loves us intimately and personally. Lord, bless us in these days ahead. Strengthen us for the times that we face. Allow us to shine with your light and your love because we live in the confidence of your promises. In Jesus' name.
Amen. God bless you. We'll see you at noon on Friday. Noon on Friday.